I'm absolutely delighted to see so many people, and I'm delighted to see so many of you not wearing ties. <laughs> I can't tell you what that does for me. It is such an encouragement. I, I've always wondered, uh, who was it that invented something you put around your neck and pull tight? <laughs> that, I mean, that just, just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, so welcome, I'm uh, Frank James, uh, president of Missio Seminary, and uh, we are delighted uh, to be a part of this. This is our second annual Faith in the Marketplace uh, conference, and we are delighted to have Bob Dahl as our speaker. Uh, Bob uh, was recommended to us by a lot of folks, some of you in the community, as someone who would be really appropriate and by the way, we've always, as we've planned and thought about this, we've looked for people who are not just business people, but people who have a heart for the Lord and who seek honestly to integrate their faith with what they do in the business community. Uh, Bob is one of those people. Uh, last year, Jeff Van Duzer spoke to us. Uh, really a wonderful, life-transforming experience for me at least. And uh, Bob and Jeff uh, know each other. And Jeff has said, uh, Bob puts into practice all the things that he and his colleagues out at uh, Seattle Pacific write about. Uh, so Bob actually does the real stuff of living out your faith in the marketplace. A uh, little background on Bob. Uh, he uh, is uh, the, let me get the title right, uh, Chief Equity Strategist and Senior Portfolio Manager at Nuveen Assessment Management. Now, I don't know exactly all that that means, and that's why I have to read it. But before that, he worked at BlackRock as the Chief Investment Officer. Before that, at Merrill Lynch Investment, and before that, he was Chief Investment Officer at Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer Funds. He's a graduate of Lehigh University, so he's local. He graduated with an MBA from uh, the Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania. And, uh-oh, uh-oh, we've got some partisans here. Uh, and you may have seen uh, Bob on uh, television. He appears frequently on CNBC and Bloomberg TV and Fox Business News, Business News talking about all kinds of things, markets and economy and all of that. Uh, one of the things that I, I feel like I need to say uh, about, about Bob is that uh, this man has a heart. I've been able to spend some time with him and uh, he has a real heart for what he does. And so it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, my friend, Bob Dahl. Thank you, Dr. James, another man without a tie. I did debate, I was just saying, I did, should I, shouldn't I? I thought, well, maybe I'll just wear jeans and a flannel shirt. And I'm, that's a little past the season for that anyway, so uh, we look very similar. I forgot my glasses, I left them in the car. Uh, otherwise we'd really, and I, I didn't grow one of these yet, but other than that. Uh, you left out the best part in, in the introduction, and that is a Phillies and an Eagles fan. <clears throat> so let me tell you a little bit more so you know where I'm going. Um, yeah, a guy in the marketplace who tries to um, live his faith. I suspect that describes just about, I hope that describes just about everybody in this room. We're all on this journey together. And we've grown up in a country where, at least when I was growing up many moons ago, <clears throat> it was, uh, can I say, normal and encouraged to be a Christian. One day I woke up and uh, <clears throat> I said, it's, it's no, no longer normal, it's just, now it's accepted to be a Christian. Then I woke up another day, not too long ago, I said, you know, <laughs> I get to this every once in a while, right? We are gradually and sadly <clears throat> removing God from our culture, which creates challenges that many other parts of the world have known for a long time, and we're just getting introduced to. As my wife says, we've not taught our kids 
how to live in persecution. And that may come. <clears throat> Some of you know that uh, in 2012, I lost my job for sharing my faith. So that can happen here in the United States of America. <clears throat> so I've been in the investment management business. So those of you that uh, signed up because you thought this was going to be a lecture on how to buy low and sell high, you know, we're going to have to do that another time. I apologize. Who knows what the market's going to do, do today? It's been wild. Uh, I've spent my entire career working at organizations that are secular, some with a few more Christians and some with a few less Christians, and many of you can identify with that, although I suspect in this room there are a number of people who are in small companies where you may even be the proprietor, as it were. And so I hope some of my comments are relevant to you as well. <clears throat> I have two chances at the apple here. The first one I'm going to... Um, I'll use the word teach, and, and, and the second one, I'm going to preach. When Frank and I met, he said, you know, at some point, make these people uncomfortable. Do you remember saying that? Make them a little uncomfortable. So you may, you know, you're, going to, you're going to be in trouble. Um, uh, whether you're uncomfortable with this first piece, uh, I, I don't know. I hope it's, in some sense, some review. How many of you here were here last year for uh, Jeff Van Duzer? Oh, good, good. At least have some of this will be, I suspect, a review. I was not here. Um, I, I regard Jeff as one of the, the leaders in this movement called Faith and Work. You know, if you go back 30 years or so and you said Faith and Work to most people, they'd have no idea what you're talking about. Today, it's far more common that people, oh, yeah, I can identify with that. There are lots of good things happening. But I think we're just scratching the surface in a lot of ways. <clears throat> I'm married to Leslie. Uh, Leslie is, uh, spends about half of her time either working on or actually in the Middle East doing missions work, uh, working to uh, introduce Muslims to Jesus Christ. I'm father of three kids, as I was telling Glenn and a few others a few minutes ago. <clears throat> um, uh, third youngest Final, graduated from college just the three weeks ago. Yes, that's a big victory. <clears throat> um, other than the investment management business, I sit on uh, 10 boards, uh, all but one faith-based. In fact, I'm going to tell you about two of them very briefly so you get a window into this believer. <clears throat> and uh, I also have the privilege of directing the choir and playing piano and, piano and organ at our church. Um, this time of year, I love to ride bikes. I have a good friend who lives not too far from here. We try to ride together about a thousand miles a year. We, we crossed 200 last weekend. So um, that's a little bit uh, about me. I want to mention uh, two of the boards I'm on. Uh, one, because it's uh, having a conference in Manila uh, next month. It's the Lausanne Movement. Some of you, I hope all of you know the Lausanne Movement. Um, the movement started uh, 45 years ago by Billy Graham and John Stott, and the goal is uh, a Christian everywhere, a church for every Christian, uh, and uh, a place for them to practice their faith. That's a, obviously a big and a noble goal. And we're having a one-week global workplace forum for uh, be almost a thousand workers gathered from all over the world to talk about some of the very issues that you're dealing with in, in your walk, and hopefully that I will speak to today. The other I'd mention is I have the privilege of being a chair of the board of uh, uh, Movement Day, movement.org. Uh, the goal of Movement Day is to bring movement days uh, to cities. Um, I'll spare you all the details, but God is working in cities, and all of the net population on the globe is growing in cities. In other words, every time somebody moves to the suburb, somebody else moves from the suburb to the city. All the net growth in the city. It's estimated that uh, by 2050, three quarters of the world will live in cities. So our view, our ministry, is to accelerate the gospel in cities by helping people come together in those cities to celebrate what God is doing, lock arms, and move forward with boldness and at a quicker speed. And Movement Day has come to Philadelphia <clears throat> this November 8th. Uh, it's a Friday. Put it on your calendar. I hope many of you can come. <clears throat> the, 
The day itself, whether it's Philadelphia or any other, is not the important day. It's the visible day. The important day is what happens before it, and more importantly, what happens after it. If we don't commit to each other in a day like that, we're going to live for Christ and do X, Y, and Z. You know, we just had a day where we come together and feel good. But this will be the feel good day where lots of people will come together, and I think we'll all be amazed what God is doing already in Philadelphia. Glenn McDowell leads it. <clears throat> so see, raise your hand, Glenn. If anybody wants to hear more, go see it. So, so much for the advertisement. <clears throat> There are many books <clears throat> written on this broad subject. I'm going to suggest a few of them to you if you want to dig deeper. My favorite is Tim Keller's book, Every Good Endeavor, actually written by C Catherine Alsdorf, but uh, Tim takes credit. <clears throat> And uh, Catherine, by the way, will be a great speaker at this conference sometime. I'll, I'll mention that to you later, Frank. The book called Every Good Endeavor, Tim Keller, Connecting Your Work for God's, to God's Plan for the World. Another is uh, Your wor Work Matters to God. This is the first one I read probably 30 years ago by uh, William, Hen William Hendricks. That's Howie Hendricks' son, if you know H Howie, and Doug Sherman. Jeff Van Duzer's book, Why Business Matters to God. <clears throat> If you're more <clears throat> an academic type, uh, David Miller, uh, formerly of Yale University, now of Princeton University, uh, wrote a book called God at Work, gives great history of the movement and where it is and where it's going. And then a guy by the name of Tom Nelson, who's a pastor in, in Kansas, has started a, an organization called... Um, um, Uh, oh, names escape me. Made to Flourish, thank you, whoever uh, clued me in. I was at their conference uh, just a couple weeks ago. Two, two books he wrote, Work Matters, very simple title, and his most recent one, The Economics of Neighborly Love, where he takes the, sermon, uh, the, uh, the story of the Good Samaritan, as we commonly hear it, it's about the compassion, right, that the, uh, good, that the good Samaritan had. And he talks about, yes, compassion is a necessary ingredient for that story, but another ingredient is resources. Think about it. The good Samaritan didn't have resources. If he wasn't a worker producing, that story may never have happened. So it was a whole eye-opening for me. So what are we going to talk about this first session? <clears throat> I would observe, and I mean this kindly, <clears throat> that churches spend a lot of time trying to equip we lay people to work in the church when we really need to be equipped to work in the world. When I have the privilege of addressing pastors, I somewhere slip in, remember, your ministry is not inside these four walls. It's outside. That's where it takes place. Billy Graham has said <clears throat> that the marketplace, the nine to five window, if you will, will be to the gospel this century what the medical profession, doctors and nurses, were to the gospel last <coughs> century. And if you know anything about church history in the last century, you know medical workers went to the far corners of the earth and people came to Jesus as they practiced their tent-making skill and won people to Christ. Most people in this room, like me, are in the nine-to-five window. So if Billy is half right, the opportunity, the responsibility that we have to be light in a dark world is just amazing and exciting. I'm also going to talk about work being a basic human need. Keller calls it the food for our soul. Many of you probably heard over time, uh, work is a necessary evil. Boy, is that shortchanging what God gave us. Or work is a means to an end. While that is true, boy, is it missing the opportunity. The average Christian spends approximately 60% of their life at work. 35% of their time on family and other community activities, and 5% at church. 
And most of our teaching in churches reverses it, does it not? We spend most of our time getting equipped to live in the church. That's important. But we need to be equipped to live in the 60% that we spend outside. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the fact that we have a lot of thorns and thistles in our work. That we are, through our culture and many of our backgrounds, separating the secular and the sacred when God put us on this planet to live integrated lives. So I'm going to talk about five things, time permitting, by the way. <clears throat> I'm going to take my watch off and put it up here, which reminds me of the story of uh, the little boy and his father who used to sit in about the third or fourth row of the church every Sunday. And the pastor had a habit as he got up to preach his sermon, taking his watch and put it up here like this. And the son eventually said to the father, pastor does that every Sunday. What, what, what does that mean? And the father said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> so we'll finish this first lecture about noon. And then we'll dig in for the afternoon session. Five things, time permitting. Integrating faith and work. Work is a holy calling. God is a worker and his design for our work. Models for work. Attitudes and behaviors at work. Needless to say, I could spend the entire 45 minutes on any one of these, so I'm just going to survey a few things, hoping some will be reviewed from last year and some will be blazing new territory. So, integrating faith and work. I already mentioned it, but our culture is moving from a place of uh, deny yourself to fulfill yourself. Is that not true? It's all about me. And if I can satisfy me, maybe I'll be of some good to the rest of the world. You know that's not what the good book teaches us. But that's our culture. <clears throat> the difference and the gap between faith and work remains serious. The ever-widening chasm between the truths of Christianity and the realities of the world I would argue those of us who are workers, and everybody's a worker whether you're getting a paycheck or not, there are three ways we can approach it. One, we can commute back and forth between the two worlds, kind of your public life at work and your private life at home and at church, if I can distinguish it that way. I spent a dozen years in my career living in Princeton, New Jersey and working in New York City. And that's the way I approached life in those days. I would get on the train and, and go to my one world, and I would come back on the train and go to my other world. In fact, the people that I interacted with Monday through Friday had zero overlap between the people I worked with, interacted with, communed with, Saturday and Sunday, if I can call it that way. That's one way we can approach it. Another way to approach it is to say, um, there's an exchange. That is to say, let's discount the value of work. We just do work because we have to. And then the nobler purposes are when we serve our families and when we worship the Lord with other believers. Boy, is that, do you think God is uninterested in 60% of our lives? Boy, does that miss it. And then finally, it's the way God envisions it, an integrated life, that we're one in the same. This came home to me when I took a job nearer home after the dozen years of doing the commute thing. And uh, my first job, I became a CEO of Merrill Lynch Investment Management, the asset management of Merrill Lynch. And my first job was to cut $700 million of expenses. That was a tall order. Uh, as I recall, the first 200 were kind of easy because we were fat, dumb, and happy. The next 300 we worked hard and analyzed, and I hope we made mostly good decisions. And the last 200, we were, uh, I went to my boss and said, we shouldn't do this. Oh, you got to do it. Okay, we'll do it. And in many businesses, service businesses, the costs are the people. 
So to get rid of 700 million expenses meant a lot of people had to disappear. One person that I had to let go was a portfolio manager. He managed a technology fund. So we're merging that fund into another one. It was tiny, it wasn't economic. And his son and my son, on a given Saturday, were going to play each other in uh, little kids' baseball. His son was the pitcher, and when my son came up to the plate, the pitcher was instructed, I found out after the fact, to throw the ball as hard as he could at my son. Now he missed, <laughs> thank the good Lord. But wow! Was that a rude awakening? You see, my two worlds came together right then and there. How was I going to react to that? <clears throat> it began, for me, a journey to understand, and I'm still on that journey, how God brings faith and work together, how it is one integrated life. Do you feel the tension when you go to work? You know, you want to do well and you got to work hard and you got to get the to-do list done and you got to earn the money. Oh, oh, there's God. I don't know about you, but when things are going well, I fall into the following temptation. I go 100 miles an hour trying to do my thing. And every once in a while, I'll turn around and say, hey, God, are you with me? <laughs> is that ever a messed up priority? God is to be up front where to follow him, right? Oh, in the valley is a different story. Lord, I need you. Can, you. can can you lead the way here? Faith and work. It's one. It's not separate. And to bring that home, I want to talk about point two, work as a holy calling. Quote uh, Keller in his book, uh, one worker would share that he kept a Bible on his desk and occasionally someone in the company would ask about it. Another prayed and the company thrived. Many viewed their corporate jobs as primarily a means to make a lot of money, to give away to charities and organizations they cared about. When I asked pastors and business people how their faith related to their work, they often answered that a Christian's primary, if not sole mission in the workplace, was to evangelize those with whom they worked. But most business people quickly realized that evangelism was not one of their gifts, and none of the approaches addressed the issue of how Christian faith should affect the way they worked. Here's another list that I came up with. The way to serve God at work is to further social justice in the world. The way to serve God at work is to be personally honest and evangelize your colleagues. The way to serve God is to work being skillful and excellent at your job. The way to serve God at work is to create beauty. The way to serve God at work is to work from a Christian motivation to glorify God, seeking to engage and influence culture to that end. The way to serve God at work is to work with a grateful, joyful, gospel-changed heart through all the ups and downs of life. The way to serve God at work is to do whatever gives you the greatest joy and passion. The way to serve God at work is to make as much money as you can so you can be generous as you can. Most of these are all very good, but do they miss the point? The Protestant Reformation, <clears throat> thank you John Calvin, Martin Luther, and others, rebirthed this concept of an integrated life. Some of you who've read those guys and studied them know it's exactly what I'm talking about. And I think the faith at work movement that has recently been rebirthed and growing here in the U.S. over the last 25, 30 years is a hearkening back to those days. Which takes me to the subject of calling, uh, explained, practiced, understood largely in the Puritan world. <clears throat> and we all know, at least I hope you do, that the Bible speaks of a primary calling and secondary callings. And I'm going to add, not in the, in the word, but uh, I think the word speaks to it, tertiary callings. Calling is something that matters to you, drives you, inspires you. It's what gets you out of bed in the morning. Often it's a hybrid of the personal and the professional activities you bring your full self to. Often a calling is something you can't not do. Discovering your calling is not finding a job. It might be finding your life. Of course, our primary calling comes from 
many passages in the Bible. I'll quote John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I trust, I hope, I pray everyone in this room has settled that with God. That you understand that every one of us is a sinner and falls short of God's standard, and as a result, we need a Savior. And you have given your life acknowledging that you are a sinner and you need forgiveness so that you can be righteous before the Holy God. That's our primary calling. Our secondary callings, plural, come from all over the place. I have a secondary calling to be a husband, a father, a friend, a worker, and a bunch of other things. So it's not just about calling our job. <clears throat> My friend Oz Guinness says, Deep in our hearts, we all want to find and fulfill a purpose bigger than ourselves. Only such a larger purpose can inspire us to heights we know we could never reach on our own. For each of us, the real purpose is personal and passionate, to know what we are here to do and why. Do you know why you're here? Uniquely you. I don't mean all of us to glorify God, as the Westminster Confession says. That's important. I'm talking about you in particular. How's God wired you? I often get answered by, uh, get asked by people mostly younger than in this room, but occasionally by a person who's going through a period, how do I find my secondary calling when it comes to vocation? I think it's really simple, like most things in life. God's not going to write it in the sky. You're not going to wake up one morning. It's usually a process that includes, one, being in the Word of God. If we're in the Word of God, we begin to understand God's wisdom and God's guidance. Great way to discover who we are. And I might add who we're not. Second is prayer. Prayer starts with a close relationship to the Lord. The third is circumstances, meaning what are your skills, what are your gifts, what do you like to do? The world sometimes calls this being at the right place at the right time, and that can happen. You know, if I looked in the mirror and said, my goal, I, I, I want to be an NBA basketball player. My circumstances are I'm probably not tall enough, and at least when I played basketball in school, I, you know, you're supposed to release the ball when you get to the highest point. I would release it here or on the way back down. Probably not for me, right? Circumstances. And the fourth is counsel. If I pursued NBA basketball, somebody would probably take me aside. Hey, Bob, can I talk to you, right? You got it. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. I referenced earlier, <clears throat> time permitting, in the second section, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more because it is part of work. Many of you in this room, I suspect, like me, have lost your job. It affects us all different ways. Many in this room probably lost worse than a job, but when you lose your job at the moment, it's a pretty traumatic experience, at least it was for me. And I formed a board of five guys to give me counsel. Boy, that made a difference. They would affirm me. They would ask me tough questions. They would pray for me. Counsel is the fourth component. You know, coming out of school, our kids debated, what am I going to study? What am I going to do? Thankfully, no, none of them, at least out loud, asked the question, what can I do to make the most money? The business I'm in, the investment management business, you get that question from time to time. Would I make more money if I went here versus there? I said, wrong question. How are you wired? What's God gifted you at? What do you enjoy doing? Our calling is where the unique circumstances of life the talent and interest set God has given us, and the needs of the world, to quote Frederick Buechner, come together. That's the sweet spot. I hope you've all found that little place. It can change from time to time. 
That's our calling. One of our many secondary callings, I alluded to the tertiary calling, so let me define what they are in my book. It's our attitudes and our actions, how we do what we do in life. Do we kick people or do we praise people, etc.? Well, we know the ultimate worker, my third point in this first section, is God as a worker and His design for work. We are all created in God's image. And so we are created to be, in some ways, like God. However, He being infinite, we being finite. Last I checked, God's a worker. If you've forgotten, take your Bible and read that first chapter. Oh my goodness, was he ever a worker. He was excellent at what he did. Wasn't he amazing? Isn't he amazing? Look out the window. And it's interesting, at the end of every day, he finished his work and he says, that was good. Right? Do you say that at the end of each day? That was good? Hmm, there's a challenge for you. And if you go a couple more chapters... Fulfill the earth and subdue it. God is passing the baton to us to be workers, is he not? Shouldn't that be an exciting motivator to get us out of the bed in the morning? Back to where I started, work is a necessary evil. Work is a means to an end. Work is my mission field. Work is a place I earn money so I can put food on the table, and if there are a couple extra bucks, I can give it to church. Boy, does that miss it. Those are important things, but it's so much more than that. Otherwise, God wouldn't have us spending more than half our time at it if it wasn't desperately important. And that's why when we lose our work through whatever set of circumstances, many of us are lost. God made us as workers. Of course, there's an extreme where people say, work is my life. And that can lead to excesses in all kinds of directions. As a quick aside, one of the things, the more and more I study God, I try to understand Him, He is a God of amazing balance. Right? Love, justice is an example. He's designed us to be like Him, so we're to be people of balance. Yes, there are seasons in life. Keller says, in in short, work, and lots of it, is an indispensable component in a meaningful human life. It is a supreme gift from God and one of the main things that gives us in our life purpose. But it must play its proper role, subservient to God. So God's a worker. He created work. And there are many psalms that speak of our work. Number four, models of work or views of work. Why do we work? You've heard it. I owe, I owe, I I owe, I owe, it's off to work I go. You've heard that song. Do you work to live? Do you work to live it up? Do you live to work? Questions to ponder. I come back to the bedrock that since we're made in God's image and He's a worker, He's designed us for work. By the way, the word retirement in most translations is nowhere to be found. In some, there's one little reference to the the word. That does not mean we don't don't retire from job A and move to job B or activity A and B. But we don't retire to put our feet up. Yes, God rested. But then he went back to work. And he's still working to sustain, to create, to save, to transform. So we're not to stop working. I love older people when they have big hearts and they become incapacitated and you ask them, what do you do? I pray. There's a major, major necessary job. I hope there's somebody praying for 
this conference right now who couldn't make it because physically they couldn't be here. Think about that for our older days. I don't know about you, I'm not a very good prayer. I'm always in a rush. I got to stop and I start praying and my, my, my mind wanders. Maybe there's a time when God will settle me down and I will pray. Colossians 3, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Many parts of the Christian life, including understanding how faith and work come together and what a work, work means, needs a perspective. I remember this in generosity and many other parts of the Christian life. And that is that we are on this planet for about this long. And we are in eternity for about this long. My goodness, if we really believe that, doesn't it change our attitudes, our actions, our behaviors, our activities? The Greeks had some very interesting ways to look at work. Work is a curse. Work is a barrier to the higher pursuits of life. Not all work is created equal. Work that uses the mind is nobler. Most of those are lies from the pit of hell, as I think you will agree. Although I will say I grew up in a culture where I don't know if it was ever said directly, but I was made to feel that the missionary's calling was way up here. The pastor was just below it. The, the difference is the missionary had to leave home and everything. The pastor usually could do it in this country, if you will. So it was a great calling, but just a step below. And then there are all the helps professions, right? The doctors and the nurses and the teachers. And I don't know what was in this big gap, but I knew what was near the bottom. It rotated. Lawyers, <laughs> business people, and politicians. They were the low life. I don't know if they just couldn't make it up here. And I guess it was drilled into me because every time a missionary went overseas, we had this big deal. You know, they came up front, they were given scripture, we prayed for them, put, laid hands on them. It was exciting. They're going off to do God's work. Do you pray for the accountants in your church on April 15th? They need your prayers. I have convinced my pastor, it took a lot of years, we, one Sunday, commission everybody. Everybody that's going into the, I'll call it secular world. And those of us who have those callings, we stand up and we're prayed for. Your work matters to God, and your work, if you are called to it, is every bit as important as Billy Graham's calling was. Boy, does that put an unbelievable excitement in your step, and might I say, a monkey on your back, right? There are also misconceptions that uh, work showed up when uh, man fell. If you read Genesis carefully, you know that's not the case. Work was instituted long before the fall. Yes, work got more difficult after the fall because God didn't curse work. He cursed the ground. Thorns and thistles. In fact, there are many affirmations of work right throughout the Scripture. Deuteronomy 8.18, God Himself is giving you power to make wealth. <laughs> I met a Christian recently who said, uh, this money I've earned, boy, did I work hard for it. It's mine. <laughs> Be careful. Who gave you the mind to work? Are you really sure it's your money? Maybe I'll come back and preach on that a little later, my friend. So secular work has no less dignity and nobility than sacred work. In fact, sec sec secular and sacred, I'm not sure there's an easy distinction there. I don't know, when I go to work every day, I, I feel I'm on a sacred journey. I hope you feel the same way. Do you pray for your work? Do you pray for the work of the day that you'll do it well so you'd be honoring to the Lord? 
I have bosses. Some of you have bosses. Some of you, maybe the bank's your boss. Maybe uh, your assistant is your boss. But for all of us, isn't the Lord Jesus our ultimate boss? Isn't that what we're reporting to? There was an era, and some still live by it, where the Great Commission governed the thought about work. Go, therefore, and make disciples. I'm off to work to make disciples. And there's nothing wrong with that either. It's a noble thing, but that's not the main purpose of work. I remember often praying, Lord, give me the chance to share my faith with Joey. And you know, it just kind of never happened. Because I was looking for this one-off, separated from work, sort of opportunity. Maybe we'll have lunch together, whatever. And so I purposed to do two very small things, and they transformed my ability, my recognition, my cognition that faith and work belong together. One was to say, if you're working in the same place, common on Mondays, how was your weekend? What did you do this weekend? And I would typically report on the things I did that weekend that were different from normal. And I said to myself, I'm going to say, assuming I did, which is most Sundays, and I went to church. I'll never forget when one guy asked me about my weekend, I told him, and I went to church. And the next Monday, he asked me again, what did you do this weekend? I told him what I did, and, and I went to church. You went to church last week. <laughs> do you go to church every week? Man, was that ever a teachable moment, right? All in the warp and woof of the workplace. The other thing, prayer. When someone would come, particularly when you're in more senior roles and you're working in big places, which I recognize you, not all of you do, but even smaller places, a worker comes to you and says, I got a problem, can we talk about it? It might be a work problem, it might be unrelated to work. Talk about it for a little while. And as the person was leaving, I would always say, I'll be praying for you. If they dared to come back a second time, we'd talk about the issue, and I would say, can I pray for you now? Do you know no one ever said no? I'm talking about people of all persuasions and backgrounds and faiths or lack thereof. No one ever said no. So now I get to pray to my God in front of this person. This person's gonna meet my Jesus in prayer it might be that Joey guy that I prayed for and it never happened. Now it's a common part of what it is that we do. Now you got to be careful of the circumstances and you can't get thrown out of the company because you were praying, but you, you get the point. Here is what I have seen to be good and fitting. This is Ecclesiastes. To eat, to drink, and to enjoy oneself in all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him, for this is his reward. Furthermore, as every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God, Ecclesiastes goes on to say. Our work is a gift. Do we have that attitude? If you name the name of Christ... In most workplaces, you're being watched. How do you react? What's important to you? How do you react in difficulties? Oh boy, we watched then, are we not? So why is it that we work aside from serving the Lord? Well, the practical things. Through work, we serve people. It's different for every one of you. To work, we do meet our own needs, the needs of our family. First Timothy is pretty stern about this one. If anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's sobering. Through work, we do earn, earn money to give to others. I will talk a little more about generosity when I talk about us being priests in the workplace in our second section. Through work, we also love God. Because God has made us a worker in His image. 
With good will render service as to the Lord, this is Ephesians, and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. This section I'm referring to in Ephesians chapter 6 talks about what we labor in as to Christ, as slaves of Christ, as to the Lord, their master and yours, fearing the Lord, as for the Lord. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. You too have a master in heaven. Do you see it's all for Jesus? <clears throat> Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Do you believe you can be transformed in your workplace? I would suspect since we're spending more than half our time there, God, God's going to transform up some of us there if we're open to who He is and what He does. The circumstances, the difficulties, the thorns and the thistles, as I mentioned, and we'll talk about again. Your work is not just a job. If you think your work is just a job, you should say your life is just a life. That's not what God intended. In fact, work is worship. I would suspect Jeff spoke to this last year. Why is work worship? Because all of life is worship, is it not? We're to worship God in all that it is that we do. Dealing with an issue at work, to make a product or a service better than it was before, is serving God's people. That's an act of worship. God has called us, and therefore He's also equipped us, no matter what your work is. Finally, behaviors and attitudes at work, number five. Time permitting, I'm going to get through seven points on this. One, exhibit godly character at work. That means be excellent, not mediocre. If we're made in God's image and He's an excellent worker, what excuse do we have to be a C-plus at work? We're to strive to get straight A's. I would say it perhaps this way. Those of us who name the name of Christ and people identify, there's a Christian over there. If we're a C at work, do you think they want to model the rest of our lives? If we're an A-plus at work, do you think they might care? What makes Harry tick? Integrity, not sleaziness, savvy, generous, not stingy. We could preach a sermon on this very first point, exhibit godly attitudes and character at work. Two, exhibit some theological depth. As Christians, if the Lord and His Word and living the Christian life is really important to us and we have no theological depth, our words and our acts don't match up. What do I mean? Somebody comes to me and says, Bob, what do you think of the stock market? Given what I do for a living, I could go on for hours, right? But if somebody comes up to me and Bob says, well, what do you think about euthanasia? What do you think about abortion? What do you think fill in the blank? And I only have two sentences. I'm saying my work is this important and the things of God are this important. It's got to be right here. Have some theological depth. And that takes work. Three. Behave as if you really believe that your citizenship is in heaven, not on earth. I mentioned this point earlier. I don't know about you, but every once in a while I have to wake up to that fact. And when I do, it changes the way I behave and my attitudes. I hope the same for you. Number four, and I recommend this for all of life. But for the workplace, be in an accountability and a mentoring relationship. Maybe it's a small group, whatever it is. We are not on this planet to be alone. Those of us that try to go alone in certain areas, we usually slip. It could be a moral failure. It could be just we become a C rather than A at a particular thing. We need help. Iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. One of my favorite proverbs, perhaps yours too. William Wilberforce did not do it alone. He had the Clapham Group. 
David didn't do it alone. He had his mighty men. Daniel had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Esther, Mordecai, and her people, right? People, people. Be an accountability mentor, especially in places where you struggle. I've got several accountability webs that I'm in. One is real simple. I need to lose 15 pounds. My wife, my assistant, and a good friend are in that little group. They have license and encouragement from me. Ask me, how'd you do today? What'd you eat? When last did you exercise? Simple, but godly, right? Do that and work too. Five, don't fear failure. Instead, fear living your life on things that don't matter. You know, the temptation, I suspect the older we get is just kind of skate through. Let me give you two extremes, the danger of busyness and the danger of the easy life. Satan, I am convinced, wants all believers to be busy beyond belief. Busy doing good things so there's no time for the best things. Because the best things are the things that matter for God, even at the workplace. So one of my prayers is, Lord, help me to give up a good thing now and then to do the best thing. Sometimes that's hard because best things require time and sacrifice and going out of your way, and they disrupt the to-do list. I don't know what that means for you, but boy, I encourage you to think about it. The other extreme is the danger of the easy life. University of Berkeley did a study with amoeba, and they put the amoeba in a set of perfect conditions. Perfect amount of light, perfect temperature, uh, perfect amount of food. Do you know what happened to those amoeba? They died. Beware. It's, it's like us. I can't wait to get to the couch. Turn the lights down a little bit, put it back a little bit. My favorite snack food over here, the channel gizmo here, and I'm big. Right, you fall asleep and then you die. <laughs> Number six, be content in your current circumstances. Boy, does God want us to smile for Him, no matter what our circumstances. Paul is the example here, is he not? How much of what he wrote did he write from really hard places, like prisons? <laughs> for I have learned to be content, flying coach, seated in the last row, middle seat, between two pleasantly plump people, next to the restroom with no window and the engine roaring loudly, and I have learned to be content flying first class with a steak dinner. I have learned to be content with a dial-up internet connection getting bumped off the internet every 10 minutes. And I have learned to be content with lightning fast, high speed, stable connections. I have learned to be content with an unreliable 15 year old car. And I have learned to be content with my brand new Mercedes. I have learned to be content when someone is cursing, insulting and rejected me. And I've learned to be content when I am praised. We are be content in all circumstances. Boy, does the workplace provide a laboratory for us to do that, does it not? And number seven, <clears throat> be generous. Generous with time, generous with talent, generous with finances and every other thing God has given you in the workplace. You know, it's, at least for us, my wife and I, it's easy for us to give to people in our church. It's a little harder for me to give somebody at work. We've gotten a little better at it. Very recently, I'm going to lose my crown for this one. Somebody at work really hurting and needing money. So we, um, we mail, mailed a $100 money order to them so they couldn't, didn't know who it was from. We did 10 of them. We mailed one every day. Isn't that kind of cool? Boy, was that person, you could see, they didn't even tell, tell anybody. Well, I didn't know that they told anybody, but boy, they had a different attitude when they came to work. Can you bless somebody that way? John D. Rockefeller was one of the wealthiest men who ever lived. You all know the story. When he died, his accountant was famously asked, how much did John D. leave? Answer, he left all of it. 
Somebody got it. My friend Randy Alcorn, boy, do I love his work on the subject, on the subject of generosity. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. Be generous in the workplace. And if you're like me, you want to get the job done so you can go do other things. And there's a time for that too, but sometimes the workplace needs us. The people in the workplace. Let me end with this. <clears throat> When I'm in town, which is not nearly enough, I have on my uh, bathroom wall that I see every morning when I get up to shave, model Christ-like attitudes, two, have a passing through mentality, three, have an own nothing perspective. I'll repeat those. Model Christ-like attitudes, have a passing through mentality, have an own nothing perspective. I doubt I live any of those completely every day, but the days I come a little closer are they days of great reward. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Don't we all live for that? And if 60% of our time is in the workplace, we better get at it. So I hope this has been a helpful start. This was the teaching part. The preaching comes later when you will feel a little uncomfortable. May I pray? Father, would you transform us? Would you transform how we live in the workplace? Transform our workplaces as a result of us being transformed. Help us to never look at work as just a job. Help us to understand that you are the ultimate worker and because we are made in your image, you desire for us to live in a similar way. May those around us who don't know you ask the reason for the way that we are. May we be a different people. Thank you for this group. Bless them, encourage them in all parts of life, but especially in their work. In Christ's name, amen.